classified military stories, it really doesn't get much better than this, does it? Well, my dear friends, it's time once again to sit back and relax with your favourite drink. And listen. The Ghosts of Fort Riley i completely forgotten about these events until, 20 years later, I hooked up with my buddy Rob when we found ourselves in the same unit deploying to Afghanistan. Fort Riley in Kansas is home of the famous U.S. Army 1st Infantry Division. It's one of the Army's oldest and most haunted posts. I was a member of the Big Red One, the nickname for the 1st Infantry Division. I served as a member of the division's Air Defense Battalion. We had a live fire exercise coming up. So the day before, we had a two-and-a-half-ton truck called a deuce-and-a-half, loaded with thousands of 20 millimeter ammunition rounds for our M163 Vulcan tracks, which we would fire at remote-controlled drones the next day. The truck with the ammunition was parked in what was called an Ammunition Staging Area, or ASA, located somewhere deep in the forest. The ammunition needed to be guarded at all times prior to the unit picking it up and transporting it to the firing point, and me and my battle buddies Jerry and Rob were detailed to be the night guards. We were all just privates at the time, and we dutifully piled in the back of an HMM WV, along with our sleeping gear, flashlights, books, and anything else we thought we needed to pass the time, along with jugs of water, a case of MREs, and a cooler of iced drink. We were also armed with two hardwood batons, about three feet long, just in case. The driver of the HMMWV was the sergeant of the guard, named Sergeant Harry. He was a short man who was overweight, out of shape, and had the reputation of being lazy and not a particularly effective squad leader. Sergeant Herring drove us down the hardball road, out behind the battalion motor pool, which turned off onto the tank trails, which led to the firing ranges and manoeuvre training areas where battalions of 1st Infantry Division tanks and armoured fighting vehicles regularly conducted war game exercises. We bounced around in the back for a few miles over meandering fields and low wooded hills, before Sergeant Herring turned off the main tank trail to follow a smaller dirt trail which led deeper into the forest. It was four in the afternoon, and the three of us, stuck in the back of the bouncing cargo compartment of the HMMWV, said nothing, while we tried to get comfortable and catch a nap. Sergeant Herring turned around, backtracked, took different trails, and then back again, obviously lost. Finally, however, he found the trail that he needed to take, which led us down into a shallow valley. He was flooring the HMMWV down the winding trail, which was only wide enough to allow one vehicle, which jostled us around even more in the back. Recklessly, Sergeant Herring followed the dirt trail up a slight incline, which led to another hardball road. The incline led to a low plateau with a square compound built on it. The compound was simply a concrete parking lot about a quarter mile square, surrounded by two chain-link fences topped with razor wire. Parked in the centre of the parking lot underneath the lights was a deuce and a half truck with the ammunition. Two one-storey shacks were built outside the fence next to the gate, which led into the fenced-in parking lot, and Sergeant Herring parked the HMMWV next to the smaller of the two shacks. Get your gear and get the hell out, yelled Sergeant Herring from the driver's compartment. This is going to be home until we're relieved tomorrow. Me, Rob, and Jerry jumped out of the back of the HMMWV and gathered our gear. The door to the small shack opened, and another squad leader, a lean, good-natured staff sergeant with a handlebar moustache named Staff Sergeant Sleet, came out saying, You're late, Sergeant Herring. It's almost 1800 hours. My guys are going to miss dinner chow at the mess hall. Did you get lost again? No, I did not get lost, said Sergeant Herring, offended. But we just smiled and nodded at Staff Sergeant Sleet behind Herring's back. Three other soldiers emerged from the larger shack, which turned out to be the guard shack. They were friends of ours from Staff Sergeant Sleet's squad who'd had the day shift guard duty. We exchanged greetings as they piled into the HMMWV to go back to the main post at Fort Riley, their duty day completed. Staff Sergeant Sleet climbed into the driver's seat and said, 
Hey, Sergeant Herring. First platoon will be coming to relieve you at 0800 tomorrow. They'll be bringing out hot chow for breakfast. Staff Sergeant Sleet then yelled back at his team. Hey, guys. We aren't going to make the chow time tonight, so pizza's on me. Sergeant Herring got lost again. The soldiers in the back of the HMMWV laughed as Staff Sergeant Sleep pulled away from the compound. As they turned onto the dirt trail, my buddy Paul, who was sitting in the back of the HMMWV, suddenly yelled to me, Rob and Jerry, Hey, watch out for ghosts. They say this SAA is haunted. We stood there watching the vehicle disappear, and I turned to Sergeant Herring and said, what did he mean by, this ASA is haunted? Ah, oh, nothing, it's nothing, replied Sergeant Herring, sounding angry and flustered. Sergeant Herring pointed at the larger shack and said, Throw your gear in there. That's where you three will be spending the night. You'll each be doing roving patrols around the perimeter of the fence in one-hour shifts. You, Sergeant Herring pointed at me. I saw how you laughed when Sleet said I got lost. You pull first guard rotation. Get out of there. Do we have radios? I asked. You know, in case of ghosts. Ah, oh, knock it off, said Herring. We don't need comms because there's no such thing as ghosts. In other words, Sergeant Herring had forgotten to bring the radios, meaning we had no communication between the ASA and our headquarters if something unexpected should occur way out the here in the middle of nowhere. Herring gathered his gear, including a small portable television, a cooler, and a mini grill and stomped off towards the smaller guard shack that was meant for the sergeant of the guard and had electricity and air conditioning. Jerry and Rob took our gear and walked towards the guard shack while I secured one of the wooden batons and began my patrol around the perimeter fence. Each side of the fence was a quarter mile long and a small path circled the outside of the fence lot. The guard shacks were located on the eastern side of the fence. The north and south sides were clear of foliage, and the plateau dipped steadily about ten to twenty feet down towards the forest. On the west side, however, the forest grew right up to the fence line. I began walking around the perimeter, enjoying the sounds of nature, the cool breeze and the crimson sky as the sun slowly set in the west. When I turned the corner to walk the western side of the fence, however, the tree seemed to swallow all light, and it felt colder, although there was no breeze. Also, there didn't seem to be any animal noises, such as birds chirping. I completed that quarter-mile stretch, and when I emerged on the north side of the fence, the bird's chirping noise returned. I completed the circuit about four times before my hour was up, and I returned to the guard shack, where Jerry was getting ready for his shift. I didn't say anything about how weird I'd felt walking the quarter-mile section of the western perimeter, and just rolled out my sleeping bag on the bare concrete floor. Heated up an MRE meal of tuna with noodles, and washed it down with an ice soda from the cooler, while talking with Rob about when he was going to get up with that exotic dancer from Tiger Island in Junction City. An hour later, Jerry had completed his shift, and Rob left to take his turn. It was getting darker. There was no electricity in our guard shack, so Jerry and I just sat around eating snacks, while Jerry bugged me about when I was going to get up with that exotic dancer at Tiger Island in Junction City. At 9pm, Robert completed his shift, and I got up to begin my second guard rotation. Rob handed me the baton and a flashlight. Here, he said, you'll need this. Hey, thanks, I said. Then I noticed that Rob seemed a bit nervous. You all right, man? I asked. Yeah, answered Rob. It's just that the um, flashlight seems to go dim on the western perimeter, where the woods go all the way up to the fence. Eh, probably just because of the trees. Yeah, probably, I said. Or oh, maybe it's ghosts. I stepped outside of the shack and breathed in the warm night air, grateful for the breeze. The moon was out and full, which bathed everything in a soft light. The lights inside the ASA were lit and shone brightly down on the ammunition truck. The lights were also on in Sergeant Herring's shack, 
although he'd pulled down the blinds. God, even at this distance, I could hear the sounds of a porn movie being played on his television. I shuddered and hoped he'd also locked the door. The perimeter lights were on and shining brightly on the north, south and east sides of the fence. But for some reason, the lights on the west side had failed to come on. When I turned the corner of the western perimeter, everything seemed to go pitch black. I could clearly see all sides of it, but the western side of the perimeter was totally dark, even with the moon fully shining. I turned on the flashlight that Roy had given me. Sure enough, it was weak, as if low on battery. The fence was on my right and the forest was to my left as I walked that portion of the perimeter. The flashlight barely illuminated the path and trees five feet in front of me, and the whole time I felt as if I were being watched by something. I cursed at Paul for putting the thought in my head that this place was haunted, and secretly hoped that he'd caught an STT from that exotic dancer from Tiger Island. Ah, the quarter-mile walk from the dark western perimeter seemed to take hours, but Eventually I made it to the corner where the forest was no longer at the fence line and the perimeter lights worked. The sun shone brightly in the sky and for some reason my flashlight shone a powerful beam of light again. Curious, I turned around and walked back the way I'd come. And my flashlight dimmed like before. <sighs> Stupid flashlight. Well, I completed my four circuits around the perimeter fence, north, east, south and then west but always dreading that west side. Now, as I said earlier, it felt as if someone or something was watching me from somewhere inside the inky black void of the forest. At 10pm my shift was up and Jerry met me at the shack, ready to take his turn as the roving guard. The sound of that porn movie was still coming from Sergeant Herring's shack, and Jerry rolled his eyes and shook his head. Yeah, three hours straight he said, and we both laughed. I handed Jerry the baton and told him about the flashlight issue, but didn't mention how creeped out I'd felt walking the western perimeter. Jerry thanked me, warned me that the MRE chili mac that Rob ate for dinner was causing him to pass gas in his sleep, and then put on headphones before beginning his guard shift. I walked into the now pitch black guard shack and felt my way to my sleeping bag. Although I thought I was too wired up to sleep, I quickly did so. I woke up at 11pm when Jerry's shift was over. Listening to Rob tell Jerry that the MRE tuna with noodles that I'd had for dinner was making me pass gas in my sleep. Well, it was dark inside the shack, save for the moonlight streaming in from the windows and open door. Jerry responded, but sounded rather worried. Scared, even. Jerry mentioned hearing something on the western side of the fence, but he couldn't make it out. He said it sounded like horses and the thunder of hooves, but it sounded faint. Feeling somewhat vindicated, I said to Rob as he left for his patrol, oh, Don't let the ghost get you. Midnight came quickly and I was pulling on my boots to begin my shift. Of course I would get the midnight shift. I met Rob at the front of the shack and... Perhaps it was a trick of the light for the moon, but at that moment, Rob was the whitest black guy I'd ever seen. He didn't look at me, but kept staring out at the western perimeter. Man, there is definitely something out there, Rob said. Every time I walked that part of the fence, the flashlight got dim and I kept hearing something. Something, I said. Well, I haven't heard anything. You will said Rob. Sounds like, I don't know, like horses and, and yelling, but really faint, just like Jerry said. Go get some sleep, man, I said as I nervously took the baton and the flashlight from Rob. Yeah, I'll take care of Casper for you. I have to warn you, though, that you might want to keep the window open. That MRE spaghetti and meatballs that Jerry had for dinner is making him pass gas in his sleep. So now it was my turn. And it was midnight. Admittedly, with some trepidation, I walked the south perimeter fence and turned to walk the western side. Once again, as soon as I turned the corner, my flashlight dimmed as I walked that dark quarter-mile corridor. I felt as if I was not even there, 
as if I was somehow outside myself and I was watching me walking underwater. Yes, it felt as if I were underwater, as it had grown cold and the air thick and hard to breathe. A mist had also risen up, further obscuring what little I could see ahead of me. The lights indicating the north perimeter seemed miles away. Then, about halfway down the western perimeter fence, I heard something off to my left, coming deep from within the forest. It sounded like horses galloping back and forth. It was faint, but it was definitely there. There was also something else. It was a feeling somewhat akin to panic, but it wasn't something I was feeling. It was like I knew there was panic, but it wasn't coming from me. I completed my first circuit around the fence and almost eagerly walked at a quick pace to get to the western side. Once again, the warm night air was replaced by an almost graveyard-like cold and mist. At about the same spot, I could hear it again. The sounds drifting in from somewhere in the dark forest of horses running. But this time it seemed closer than before, the sounds more distinct. Also, I could hear some of the horses whinnying, as if they were in pain. I tried to shake it off, still arguing with myself that this was just my imagination. The thought of horses in pain suddenly made me feel sad. I'm sorry I got you into this, boy. We've been through a lot together. I'm sorry, boy. They ain't taking any prisoners. I ran to the lights, marking the north perimeter. Oh, what was that? What was it I'd just felt? It was sadness, but it wasn't mine. What was going on? I looked at my watch under the lights. My shift was almost over, but how? I mean, it usually took me four circuits around the perimeter, but I'd barely gone two. I completed my circuit and walked past Sergeant Herring's shack. Got five hours of washing, Paul. Really, Sergeant Herring? And headed towards our guard shack. Jerry was already waiting for me to get back so he could start his shift. Anything new and exciting? Jerry asked. Oh, you'll see, I answered. What does that mean? Jerry asked, taking the baton and the flashlight from me. Did you hear something out on the western side where the forest comes up to the fence? Well, I don't know, I answered. Maybe, but just be careful. I was sitting up on my sleeping bag, leaning my back against the concrete wall and trying to figure out what I'd just experienced. Sadness. Regret. But they weren't my feelings or my memories. I heard horses whinnying in pain, but I also swear that I heard human voices as well. About twenty minutes later, I heard a pounding on Sergeant Herring's shack. Rob and I got up and opened the door to see Jerry pounding on the door to Sergeant Herring's shack and yelling, What's out there, Sergeant? You know what's out there. What is it? Sergeant Herring never opened the door. Instead, he yelled from inside his shack, You just shut your mouth, Private, and do what you're told to do. Stop asking me stupid questions and get back out there, or I will write you up. Rob and I joined Jerry outside of Sergeant Herring's shack, and I said, Sergeant, it's me, Private Fox. What's out there? What are we dealing with? Sergeant Herring cursed from behind the door. Oh, it's Private Fox. Private question, my question, Barry. Look, I said to stop asking questions. I swear if you don't shut your mouth and carry out your orders, I will write up all of you for insubordination. Now go away, leave me alone. Sergeant Herring sounded terrified. Out of all the ASAs on this base, they had to put me in charge of this one. Sergeant Herring complained. You'll all be fine. When it gets lighter, I'll show you. Show us what, Sergeant? I asked. I said, you'll be fine, screamed Sergeant Herring as he finally shut off his porn movies and everything went dark inside his shack. Now, go away. Just leave me alone. Rob and I offered to go with Jerry to finish his shift, but Jerry declined. That's fine, Jerry said. I got this. At this point I could tell that Jerry was more disgusted with Sergeant Herring than he was afraid of whatever was on the western perimeter. 
At 2am, Jerry's shift was over and Rob got up to take his place. Jerry didn't say anything when he got back to our shack. He simply shook his head as Rob went out the door. I'm not sleepy, I said. You want me to come with you? I'm good, answered Rob as he took the baton and the flashlight from Jerry and disappeared out the door. Jerry rolled into his sleeping bag, lost in thought. Although we were all experiencing the same phenomenon, I want to talk about it. We were soldiers with a job to do, and we would do what was required of us. There'd be plenty of time to sort out what happened later. I couldn't sleep, so I went outside to get some fresh air. Loud snoring was coming from Sergeant Herring's shack. I looked to the fence line and saw a figure standing under the lights at the south perimeter of the corner. It was Rob. He was standing stark still, staring west into the thick forest. I walked up behind him. I'm at your six, Rob, I said so as to not startle him, but he still jumped at the sound of my voice. What are you doing here? he said. you still got another thirty minutes before you have to be on shift. I can't sleep, I answered. I can't move, said Rob. I can't bring myself to turn this corner and walk down that path. Come on, I said, leading the way. I'll go with you. As soon as we turned that corner, the flashlight went dim again, and the mist seemed to be chest high now. The temperature seemed to be dropping the further we went down the fence line until, again, near the middle of that part of the fence, my fingers began to feel numb from the cold, as if I'd been submerged in ice. Stop! 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 whispered Rob. He shone the flashlight into the prevailing darkness, but it barely illuminated the trees, which seemed to reach out at us. Do you hear it? I nodded. This time the sound was unmistakable. Somewhere out in the distance of that solid black forest, a battle was taking place. The thunder of horses' hooves, the yelling of men, the battle cries of Native Americans the screams of the dying. It was all there just beyond the reach of the pathetic illumination from our flashlight. I had an overwhelming sadness come over me. Somewhere brave men and horses were fighting and dying. Somewhere out there. And then it was gone. Rob's flashlight shone in full brilliance, illuminating the surrounding woods. The mist was gone as if it had never been there and the cold air was replaced by a cool early morning breeze. I also realized that it had become easier to breathe again, and that the heaviness seemed to have been lifted. Rob and I looked at each other, the sadness also seeming to have vanished. We simply shrugged. I did my 3 a.m. guard shift around the perimeter, but nothing unusual happened, nor did anything unusual happen on either of Jerry or Rob's subsequent shifts. As promised, at 0800 in the morning, first platoon arrived with hot breakfast chow and time to take possession of the deuce and a half truck and all of the 20 millimeter ammunition. The sun was rising in the cloudless blue sky and it promised to be a great day of shooting our Vulcan cannons. Sergeant Herring finally opened the door to his shack, appearing to be nicely rested and helped himself to the lion's portion of the breakfast chow while complaining to the first platoon leader about how he doesn't get this new generation of lazy young soldiers. In fact, Sergeant Herring helped himself to so much breakfast chow that Jerry, Rob and I had to content ourselves with hot coffee and dry cereal. Eager to get out of the ASA, Sergeant Herring yelled at us to get our gear and get in the back of the HMMWV. Jerry, Rob and I just stared at him. Sergeant, I said. Last night you said you'd show us what was out there when it became light. Show you? Show you what? stuttered Sergeant Herring. I didn't say I was going to show you anything. Sergeant, said Jerry, you told us you'd show us what was out there in those woods. Sergeant Herring cursed again. Private, I am ordering you to. Hey, isn't there a grave around here? interrupted Lieutenant Cook, the first big platoon leader with the ranger tab. You know, 
Fort Riley used to be a horse cavalry post. I think it'd be a good learning moment to take these young soldiers to see the history of this place. Don't you agree, Sergeant Herring? Yeah, y yes, sir, gulped Sergeant Herring. Do you know where those graves are located, Sergeant Herring? Asked Lieutenant Cook. Yes, squeaked Sergeant Herring. Well, take us there, Sergeant, smiled Lieutenant Cook. I'd like to see it. A visibly pale Sergeant Herring led us, Lieutenant Cook, and about fifteen other soldiers from 1st Platoon out to the back of the ASC, where the woods reached the western part of the perimeter. About midway was a small trail which led down off the plateau and into the woods. So small and narrow that one would easily overlook it, unless they knew exactly where to find it. In the darkness, Jerry, Rob and I had completely missed seeing it. The trail wound between thick trees and clinging vines as it descended deeper into the valley for about 150 metres, before emerging into a clearing about 25 foot square. There, in the middle of the leaf-strewn clearing, were two grave markers, each topped with the brass image of a horse. The names on the plaques had faded, so I couldn't read what was inscribed on them. The morning sun shone down through the trees upon this quiet and solemn place. Sir said Sergeant Herring. Buried here are two horses from General Custer's cavalry troop. They were killed at the Battle of Little Bighorn and brought back to Fort Riley to be laid to rest. And there you have it. Sergeant Herring had given us the answer to our mystery. None of us ever talked about what happened during our guard duty that night. As a soldier, you learn to accept things as they are, whether they be normal or paranormal so long as nothing gets in the way of accomplishing the mission. It's just something that happens which soldiers have to adjust to when performing our duties. Army Scout Hunted by Bigfoot, and vice versa. Looking back at almost 30 years of service as a soldier in the US Army, I can comfortably say that it was an honour and a privilege to serve such a great and remarkable country. During my time I managed to acquire several Combat Military Occupational Specialties, or MOS, to include Vulcan Gunner, Stinger Gunner, Artillery Gunner and Combat Infantryman. My favourite MOS, however, definitely has to be Cavalry Scout. As the name implies, an army cavalry scout is the eyes and ears of the maneuvering combat battalion. We usually operate alone and far ahead of the main combat force, oftentimes behind enemy lines. Using stealth and silence, we locate enemy positions, determine where they've laid their mines, locate their barriers and ambush positions, and find ways to outflank their defensive positions. Now, to be a scout, you have to be able to act independently and confidently, because more often than not, army scouts will usually be outnumbered and surrounded. Conducting reconnaissance behind enemy lines is not a job for everybody, but if you're daring and crazy enough, it's a job that a select few would really enjoy. The one skill that an army scout needs, above all else, is the ability to read a map, determine your coordinates on the ground, and have the ability to navigate stealthily to your objective. A scout is virtually useless if he cannot read a map and ends up getting lost. As such, a large part of a scout's treading consists of land navigation in all terrains, weather conditions and environments which include forests, dense woodland, deserts and swamps. While I was training to be a scout, our class was dropped out in the middle of a dense forest somewhere in Pennsylvania at 11 o'clock at night. It was a cool November evening, and the only illumination came from the full moon, which shone brightly in the sky. There were sixteen of us who'd advanced to this phase of training, including one guy who was a former U.S. Navy SEAL. We were each given a map, a compass, a red lens flashlight, water, night vision goggles, NVGs, and four hours to find at least four out of five points located on the map. Each point we had to find was located somewhere inside the black forest that surrounded us. Our point consisted of nothing more than a wooden pole sticking out of the ground with an ammunition can at the base. Inside the ammunition can was a description of an enemy position. For example, the description might read, Enemy machine gun position facing north. 
The scout would then have to write down something like, at vicinity grid AA, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero. There is an enemy machine gun position facing north. Now, besides the darkness, there were several other factors working against us. For one, some of the points were located relatively close together, separated by about 20 meters or so. And this meant that the scout had to track precisely to the correct point, or else risk navigating to the wrong point. Also, all 16 of us were given different points to navigate to, so there would be absolutely no helping each other. This was strictly an individual training event, and it was timed. Anyone who failed to successfully find their four out of five points in the designated time would have to come back tomorrow evening and try again. And finally, we were told that there were several enemy soldiers out there somewhere in the forest who would be hunting us. If one of them caught us, we would be brought back to the start point and have to do it all over again. The land navigation was a densely forested area, roughly 10 square miles, and was crisscrossed with streams which we would have to navigate in the dark. A dirt road surrounded the entire area, and if a scout came to a dirt road, he knew he'd reached a boundary. Also, if a scout became completely lost in the dark, he was to make his way to a dirt road and wait for pickup, and the joking and insults which were sure to follow. The instructor gave me a list of five points, and I went to the front of the HMM WV and used the hood as a makeshift table. Using my red lens flashlight, I plotted all five points on my map. This was perhaps the most important part of the process, because if a scout plotted his points incorrectly on the map, he would never find his points, especially in a pitch-black forest. After double and triple checking that I had exactly corrected my plotted points, I studied the map to see what terrain I could expect. Two of my points were located on small hilltops. Two were located in a valley which would require me to cross two streams, and one was located near the boundary next to the dirt road. That last point was farthest out, but also the easiest to find. All my five points were located in an area roughly three miles square. And my plan was to find that last point first, then work my way back to the start point. The only variable that I could not control were the enemy soldiers who would be hunting us. After assuring that my NVGs operated correctly, I secured it on my forehead. Satisfied that I had all my gear secured to make as little noise as possible, I stepped off of the dirt road and plunged down into the black forest. Immediately, unseen branches like skeletal fingers reached out from the darkness to scratch my face and hands. I was only 20 meters inside the wood line, but already the sounds and activities behind me had all but disappeared. I slowly knelt, closing my eyes and letting my ears see into the darkness. To my left, about 10 meters away, one of my fellow scouts was also moving through the forest to find his points. Further ahead of me, I could hear movements somewhere in the forest, a skittering noise running through the undergrowth, perhaps a raccoon or some other rodent. The fallen leaves on the ground crunching underfoot would give away our movement. We'd have to be extra careful and stealthy to avoid attracting attention. I got up and continued walking towards my first point, counting my steps so that I could judge how far I'd travelled and keeping my eyes on my compass to ensure that I was heading in the correct direction. I was suffering from tunnel vision, as I could only see what was directly in front of me. I had almost no peripheral vision because of my NVGs. The terrain was steadily sloping downwards as I descended into the valley. Occasionally I would stop and kneel to scan my surroundings to see if I was being followed. So far, however, it was all quiet. It appeared that I was alone on this stretch of forest. At the bottom of the valley the ground became muddy and at one point I sank to the top of my boots in cold mud. A stream about eight feet wide crossed in front of me. I debated on whether to cross the stream or find a way around it. Farther upstream, by a few hundred meters, I heard a loud splash, followed by a soldier yelling, oh, Son of a... Well, I chuckled to myself and silently climbed down into the stream. Looking left and right to ensure I wasn't spotted, I climbed over a few fallen tree branches and waded into the water. 
It was ice cold and came up to my knees, but at least the running water was washing the mud off my boots. Upon reaching the other side, I climbed up the muddy shore on the opposite bank. Stopping briefly to make sure that I was undetected, I hauled myself up on an embankment and, wet, cold and muddy, continued up the slope of the valley. Fortunately, since it was November, mosquitoes or any other buzzing insects were a minor annoyance. However, as I walked up that slope, I slowly began to realise that I hadn't heard any buzzing insect noises at all. If you've done this job long enough, you begin to develop what I call a warning radar. A sense that there's something just not right with your surroundings. You learn to trust your warning radar, and I could swear that I was being watched. This annoyed me more than anything, because I was the one who did the stalking. I did not like being stalked. At the top of the slope, I got on the ground and scanned the area again. Yep, there he was. About fifty metres to my right front, Crouching behind a stand of trees was an enemy soldier. He was looking away from me, probably trying to stalk the other soldier who'd yelled when he fell into the stream. Night sound carries further, so I very slowly crawled back down the slope and walked another fifty metres away from the enemy soldier and climbed the slope again. Scanning the area around me, I found that the path ahead was clear. I pulled out a poncho from a small pack on my back and covered myself with it. Pulling out my map and my flashlight, I determined how far off course I'd gone and adjusted my heading and pace count. Satisfied that I was still heading in the right direction, I put the poncho away and slowly stood up to proceed ahead. Suddenly, far off to my left, I heard the enemy soldier yell, You've been captured, scout. Return to the start point and restart your mission. I chuckled again when I heard the voice of the scout who'd fallen into the stream yell, Oh, son of a... I continued walking through the forest, and the trees eventually thinned out. I stopped again and took a knee behind a fallen tree, listening. My internal warning radar was giving me the all clear. I closed my eyes and let my ears see for me again. Ahead of me, I could hear the low rumbling of an HMMWV. Just as I calculated, the dirt road marking the perimeter was about 200 metres ahead of me. I waited until the sound of the HMMWV had passed by. Then I made my way to the road, stopping just inside the wood line. I looked right, and sure enough, only 20 feet away, just off the road, was my first point cautiously approached the wooden pole and grabbed the ammunition can and took it back into the tree line. I crept open the ammunition can and the noise of the metal can opening seemed to scream in the dark. I cursed, but apparently nobody heard the noise. Covering myself again with the poncho, I took out my flashlight and copied down what was written on the enemy description in the can. Red vicinity grid PB-3354459 is an enemy patrol near the road. I put the ammunition can back at the point and walked back into the forest. An hour and a half had passed and I found my first point. I had another two and a half hours to find at least three more points, but those would go quicker. My next two points were south of me, almost in a straight line on the slopes of a hill. Although it would have been easier to walk along the crest of the hill to get to my next point, I didn't want to risk being silhouetted by the moon, so I stayed below the crest of the hill, where the trees were thicker but the movement was slower. I paralleled to the top of the hill for about 300 metres until I came to the spot where my second point should be. Low crawling to the top of the hill, I scanned around with the NVGs. I was off by about 50 feet. But there was my second point, sticking straight up in the middle of a clearing. I was about to get up and approach the point, when my warning radar went off inside my head. I was not alone. I knelt back down and scanned the forest area surrounding the clearing again. A faint scent of feces, like cow dung, wafted across the clearing. There! Seventy-five metres at my one o'clock, 
A figure looking like he was wearing a sniper's ghillie suit was peering out of the forest. It wasn't one of my fellow scouts because we didn't have the ghillie suit camouflage, so it must have been one of the enemy soldiers. And boy, did he stink. I hated to think what he'd fallen into. Fortunately, he wasn't looking in my direction. I observed him for a few tense seconds, then he stood up and turned to leave. Wow, that guy was huge. I waited a few more seconds until I couldn't smell him anymore. Then I entered the clearing to retrieve the ammunition can. At vicinity grid PB3009-6687 is an enemy anti-tank emplacement at the top of the hill. I came off the top of the hill, grateful to be back inside the thick tree line. But the leaves crunching under my boots sounded like the roar of jets in that dark and lonely forest. Every crunching seemed to shout, Hey, there's a scout right here! Crunch, 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 crunch. I stopped suddenly and slowly got down on my belly. Crunch, 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 crunch. The footsteps were behind me, approaching my position. I cursed. Stinky enemy soldier in the ghillie suit was stalking me. Well, he must have been beyond 75 meters from me because I didn't smell him. If I'd had the time, I would have evaded around him, but another thirty minutes had passed and I needed to get to my third point. I needed to get to where the trees weren't so thick, so I made my way back up the slope and was able to fast walk and jog across the crest of the hill for about a quarter mile. The bad part was that, because I'd chosen to go back up the slope, the full moon had illuminated me during that whole time. Also, my pace count was off although I knew that I was still headed generally in the right direction to my third point. I ran down the slope and back into the wood line again, stopping to see if stinky enemy soldier in the ghillie suit had followed me. Well, satisfied that I lost him, I began searching the area for my third point. Because I'd made a detour up the slope and had lost my pace count, I was not as accurate in positioning myself close to the third point. I just knew it was around here somewhere, here in a 50 meter radius. The bad thing about NVGs is that, while it gives the wearer an amazing ability to see in the dark, it also severely limits the wearer's depth perception. I found the point literally by accident when I inadvertently kicked over the ammunition can. The loud clang echoed in the night, and I shook my head, cursing my bad <laughs> good luck. Pulling out my flashlight again, I copied down the enemy description that was inside of the ammunition can. A vicinity grid PB2883475 is an enemy command post. I returned the ammunition can back to the point and was turning to go to my fourth point when I could make out the faint smell of cow dung again. Ah, oh, man, enemy stinky soldier in the ghillie suit sure was fast for a big guy as well as being persistent. It was almost two in the morning now, which meant that I had a little over an hour to find my fourth point. If I had any time left, I'd look for the fifth point, which was only a quarter mile from the start point. I turned due south and headed back down into the valley. The whole time my warning radar was going off in my head. Sometimes I thought I could smell the cow dung, I secretly wished that stinky guy stalking me would fall into the stream. The trees were much thicker towards the base of the valley where the stream ran, so it was much darker with very little moonlight shining through. But it was still pleasantly cool, although I was hot and sweaty by this time. I calculated that I was at the bend in the stream, about 500 meters away from where I'd first crossed it. This fourth point was weird because it looked to be directly in the stream on my map meaning it could be either on the bank or in the stream. I wasn't looking forward to searching both sides of the stream, but I didn't have much choice. I knew that my fourth point was here somewhere close by. I silently searched my side of the muddy stream, first for about 50 meters. The rippling of the waters masked any noise I made, but it also masked the noise of any approaching bad guys as well. Finding nothing on my side of the stream, 
I once again climbed down an embankment and waded across the icy cold water to the other side and began my search again. I searched for another fifty meters and still saw nothing except mud and fallen trees. I was beginning to doubt that I'd plotted this point correctly when I looked at the stream again and noticed something that I hadn't seen before. In the middle of the stream was a narrow dry spot of land like a miniature four-foot square island. In the middle of this little island was my fourth point. I waded back into the water, and after I covered myself with my poncho, I quickly opened the ammunition can. A vicinity grid PA 00958824 is an enemy submarine base. <laughs> really, I thought. A submarine base? <sighs> Whatever. I closed the ammunition can and set it back down. And the smell of cow dung seemed to hit me like the heat you feel when you open a hot stove. I cursed. Even though I'd found the necessary points that I needed, I still had to get back to the start point without being caught, or else I'd have to do this all over again. God, how did Stinky Guy keep finding me? Very slowly, I knelt down on the island and crawled backwards into the freezing water. That smell was all around me, and there was a noise like branches breaking on the bank, followed by splashing sounds only fifty meters to my left. The moon shone down at the place where there was a bend in the stream and outlined in it was a big, big, stinky enemy soldier guy. Most of my body was submerged in the water, with my upper body hugging that little strip of island in the middle of the stream. I looked up at the guy who was fifty meters away from me, and I gulped. What I had, at first thought, was a ghillie suit. It was actually fur. It was a good seven and a half to eight feet tall, had a gorilla-like face, and was covered with dark, thick fur. The creature stood in the middle of the stream, looking around and seeming to sniff at the air. Oh, great, I thought. I'm being stalked by a Sasquatchfoot, or whatever the heck they're called. But since I know where you are, and you don't know where I am, I guess I'm stalking you now. I began wondering if I'd actually packed more beef sticks in my pack, since I saw a commercial once on television where the Sasquatchfoot things seemed to like beef sticks. All of a sudden, in the distance, came the blaring of multiple horns, which seemed to echo all around the valley. I cursed again. It was a warning signal that all scouts had thirty minutes to finish finding their points and return to the start line. And by this point, I was more annoyed than I was frightened. I was wet, cold, irritated, and muddy. Fortunately, I'd wrapped my waterproof notebook with all my plot points inside of my waterproof poncho, and kept it on the small island and out of the water. But still, I only had thirty minutes to make it back to the start line. But tall, dark, and stinky was standing in the middle of the stream, looking around him like a lost grandpa at the mall. Oh, that big, hairy McDingleberry was going to cost me getting my recon scout qualification. Oh, it seemed like I lay there for hours, but in reality it was probably only a few seconds. After the horn started blaring, Big Stinky seemed to let out a huff and ran back up the embankment from which he'd emerged. Well, I waited for the smell to dissipate before hauling myself out of the stream and double-timed it back to the start point. Although I was the last scout to return to the start point, I was feeling pretty good when our trucks brought us back to the barracks. Two scouts had got lost and had to be picked up by the side of the road, and two other scouts failed to find four of their five points. These guys would have to try again tomorrow night. Well, only one guy, the former Navy SEAL, found all five of his points. And, well, although I only found just enough points to pass the course, I did also stalk a Bigfoot. How many other cavalry scouts can say that?
Well, I hope you all enjoyed those two stories. Uh, more to come. At least one more video of uh, stories like this. And hopefully the author is going to provide a lot, lot more because I really enjoyed narrating those. A lot of fun, a lot of intrigue and mystery too. Your thoughts, feelings and comments in the section below the video, as always. I'll do my best to try and reply to some. Yeah, I always say that, don't I? But I really will try this time. Well, my dear friends, that is enough for me for one night. Um, if you didn't see my big new uh, collaboration with Unit 522 over on his channel, go check it out. I put it on the community tab uh, for you all to enjoy. That's enough for, that for a while, isn't it? See you again tomorrow night. Until then, very, very sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>